Thank you, Liana. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And it's, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to have this coincidence that we have this Nature paper coming out the same day as this very important meeting. And, and I'll, I'll make good use of it, talking to such a distinguished audience, and also reminding the fact that this, this paper and what I'll be presenting here would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the great advancements in Earth system science ambassadored and carried out by the, the IGBP. And actually, it's interesting that two of the co-authors are, are former colleagues to you, Sybil, both Will Steffen and Kevin Noon, who are in, in the room, and, and Henning Rood, who's also here as another co-author. And it really takes the starting point in, in Gunnar Ökvist's uh, starting quote this morning, where he quoted Ban Ki-moon as saying that humanity has its foot on the accelerator and we're heading toward the abyss. And I think there's good arguments to say that we've spent decades in our environmental research to study the accelerator, to study the trends on how hard do we have our foot on the accelerator. Some research has focused on whether we're going uphill or downhill, but there's been very little or relatively little research trying to define the abyss, trying to define is there a threshold out there, in what systems, and how could we create a safe space within which humanity can develop to avoid falling over deleterious or catastrophic thresholds. And the planetary boundaries concept is, is a proposition. It's uh, potentially provocative, but it's a challenge to us as scientists to say, is it time in the Anthropocene when we have evidence, not least coming from the IGBP research, so this is the paper, it's, it's handed out and available here, that we have entered a new era, that we in fact are entering the Anthropocene, as, as pointed out by Paul Crutzen, who's also co-author of the paper, where humanity is the prime driver of change at the Earth system level, and that we cannot anymore exclude that we're fiddling with hardwired processes at the Earth system scale. And therefore, sustainable development turns into so say, a new agenda. Rather than focusing on minimizing environmental impacts of, of our current growth model, the big question be, becomes, what is the, the safe playing field? You wouldn't play a game of football without having your sidelines showing clearly when the game is out, when you cross a line. But we seem to be running human development without those lines, without knowing the safe space for development. And that is the, the big question tried for the first time to be answered by, by this team. Well, the evidence why this is a relevant question, I think, is as well known in this room, of course, that the hockey stick pattern we've seen over the past 150 years does not only apply to carbon dioxide, but to basically all key indicators that form the basis for human well-being. And that this is being, if anything, corroborated by the talks this morning, and also by recent research, for example, here on, on the anomaly of temperature in the Arctic, which of course underlies the whole morning's discussion. And that this great acceleration kicks off sometime in the mid-50s when we, so to say, seem to be pushing ourselves into a new geological era, the Anthropocene. This picture has been up before. I, I return to it because this is the starting point for the whole concept. That we basically say, well, if we actually have to ask ourselves whether humanity could be the force pushing the whole Earth system or key subsystems of the Earth systems across thresholds, what is the desired state we want to maintain? What's our reference point? Well, we took a very... Um, you could call it a normative stance, but I would call it an evidence-based stance that this is our desired state that the extraordinarily stable period, the Holocene state over the last 10, 11,000 years, probably has to be defined as a prerequisite for human development as we know it. We know that we invented agriculture 2,000 years into the Holocene. We know that that was the start of the civilizations as we know it. And we know that we had a very jumpy ride over the 100,000 plus years before that when we were roaming around the planet, very few of us as hunters and gatherers. We also know that this is the period, just over the last end of this Holocene, that we are propelling ourselves outside the narrow range of how the planet has operated. And as pointed out this morning, it's not only extraordinary, but at least for what we know, with a high degree of uncertainty, for the next couple of thousand years, if we don't fiddle too much with processes at the larger scale, we can expect to remain in that desired state. So that's the normative, or let's say the, the, the starting point of this analysis. And then we link that Earth system advancements, the Holocene reference point, with the 
increasing evidence from complex adaptive systems research, from resilience theory over the past two, three, four decades, realizing that ecosystems from local to regional scale do present nonlinear dynamics, and that nonlinear dynamics seems to be more universal than, than the exception, and that we have empirical examples from a large range of systems that we actually have multiple stable states and that we can define desired states for not only for the planet as such but for humanity and that we have an inbuilt ability to buffer stress and triggers can get systems to topple over in a very abrupt, often irreversible, nonlinear fashion into undesired states. But this research, which now has a, a database which can go on for hours and hours, has not asked the question whether this applies to the global level. Could we actually ask the same question whether we have multiple stable states for the Earth system, and is there a risk that humanity, that there's an anthropogenic risk of putting ourselves in this situation where we come closer to undesired thresholds, which are, so to say, a concern at the larger level? And this is then the, the quest or the question put to a group of Earth system scientists, actually both from the social and environmental scientists, and again to remind ourselves that this is basically a proof of concept proposition. It's a challenge to science, and it's also a challenge to policy, and it's something that we look forward to to see whether it carries forward as one constructive way of adding value to the sustainable development agenda. Now, where does this originate from, and, and, and how come it, so to say, can be claimed to be an advancement in science? I, I would argue that the reason for this is that we try, in a transdisciplinary way, link three strands of very important scientific advancements over the past two, three decades. The first one is very much set in this room and in the institutional representation of global environmental change research, the great advancements just over the past five, ten years on Earth system science, all the way from the IPCC to the Earth System Science Partnership, definitely building on the old legacies from Boulding's Spaceship Earth and, and the whole Club of Rome thinking, the ecological economics research agenda of Bob Constanza and others, but then linking that with the work on resilience, even the Gaia theory from James Lovelock with understanding the Earth as a, a self-regulating complex system, the tipping elements research by Tim Lenton and John Schellenhuber and others, and of course, the, the important work on, on guardrails, which tries to link not only the biophysical sciences, but also with the more policy and economic and social realities in compromising on, on what could be say, desired limits or desired safe spaces for development. So these, when these collide, you end up with what we have proposed to be called the planetary boundaries concept. It is um, complementary to, to previous advancements. And one very, very important difference, and it might surprise uh, this audience coming from someone who, who heads a, 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 a center that prides itself to do social ecological research, what we realized is that blurring the social ecological too far may have been one of the dilemmas in the past. because. When we do limits to growth and, so to say, mix up our innovation capacity, our economic development and human demands with capacity of the earth to provide those services, we end up with this blame game that, after all, you become a neo Malthusian doomsday prophet if you don't understand that the Green Revolution actually solved much of the hunger problem. What we say is that perhaps we need to, in the Anthropocene, back away from that social dimension and ask ourselves, what are the prerequisite for the Earth system as such to remain in a stable state, irrespective of whether we are one or 10 billion, irrespective of whether we are poor or rich, or irrespective of whether we consume in a sustainable or unsustainable way, and define it from the perspective of a theory on multiple stable states, and then lift it into policy. Because within the safe space, you can have very many growth models and very many ways of delivering welfare. The whole notion then starts by saying, okay, so if we are on Ban Ki-moon's road, you don't want to come too close to the foaming water on that threshold. When you come too close, you have an uncertainty range. You basically are standing on quite unsafe grounds. You don't want to be where this gentleman is. Actually, you're not allowed to be there because at Vic Falls, you have a fence. And beyond that fence, you don't go. So the boundary notion is 
what's the safe fence area